Hello, welcome to the first uh, mini lesson in the cell communications chapter. So I wanna talk a little bit uh, about why we're doing chapter six now at the very end of the term, because it doesn't really seem to fit with DNA and gene expression. Um, as we were developing this course for the shorter 10 week uh, period, we working with Gary and Steven, we noticed that the labs would line up with the lectures um, almost identically all the way up through the end. If we took chapter six out, between chapters five and seven and put at the end. And then um, there's no lab that goes along with chapter six. So you'll be working on your, um, getting ready and doing your lab practicum in week 10 while you're learning chapter six material in week 10 here um, in the lecture portion. So it normally is presented after chapter five and before cell metabolism and enzymes and stuff, but I think it really is a standalone chapter. So I think moving it to the end was more beneficial for the labs to line up with the lecture material. So that's kind of the reasoning why the schedule is a little bit different. Um, so af uh, after getting that out of the way, so this picture that I put up, um, so when we do this in class, I put this up on the, on the big overhead. It's this huge diagram that looks really crazy and confusing. Um, and it's not to be intimidating in any way. It's just to show you how complex cell communication really is. We're not gonna be learning anywhere close to the complexity of this. Um, transduction pathway that we have here, but I just wanted to have you guys keep in mind um, that cell communication is really, really important in triggering cell processes and cellular responses, replication of DNA, expressing of genes, uh, cells dividing, all of the processes that we've learned up to this point, which is a really good kind of culminating chapter to end the term with, is everything that we learned about um, transport, active transport, passive transport, osmosis, and then all the enzymes and the me metabolism reactions and the mitochondria and mitosis and meiosis and DNA replication and gene expression, it's all regulated by cell communication. So this is a really good finale, I guess, if you will. Um, I'm also gonna post in one of the helpful videos, kind of a fun YouTube video that I also show as at the beginning of this chapter. It is a cute Rube Goldberg video with puppies. You can't go wrong with puppies, right? Um, and so I use that as an analogy for what cell communication is. You have a signal, which you'll see in the video, kind of the starting point, that is gonna trigger a whole bunch of steps in the middle to get to the end result, which you'll see is at the very end of this uh, little YouTube video. It's a commercial for cat or pet food, I think, not cat food, dog food. So you have the signal, you have the reception, you have a whole lot of steps in between, and then you get the reaction. And that's basically what we're gonna be doing is gonna be breaking down cell communication into those four stages, which I'm gonna show you next. All right, so here they are, four stages of cell signaling. And then each one of these, I am going to break down into its own little mini lesson. So this one includes the introduction, um, but it's primarily gonna be covering step one. And then the next mini lesson will be on reception and then signal transduction and responses. And within these lessons, I'm just gonna be kind of talking about what it is and then giving you the examples uh, that exemplify or show you how some of the cells do those four stages. All right, so let's take a look. The first stage is cell uh, sending a signal. So a signal's gotta be sent. That could come from lots of different places. Um, it could come from another cell. It could come from the environment. It could come from its own cell, like a self uh, signal. So in this case, the signaling cell is this guy right here. And the red triangles are the signaling molecule. So this is step one, sending the signal. Hello, hello, what's going on? Right, so this, the body is sending out signals from all, all these different places, which we're gonna see some examples next. Step two is reception. So somebody's gonna be listening. So the target cell, the receiving cell is going to be able to recognize that signal, right? So here's your receptor. This is step two, okay? Once that signaling molecule binds to the receptor, that's gonna be triggering all those crazy steps in the middle. So if you wanna stop and go watch the puppy Rube Goldberg, you can, and then come back and all of this stuff that we have here, this is just the puppy Rube Goldberg. It is all of the steps to get from the signal to begin with to the result. So what has to happen inside of the cell to get from point A to point B or D or F or Z or however many steps it's going to take 
So this is what we call signal transduction. And then the response, you could get any number of responses. So it could be changing in membrane permeability, which means opening and closing channels. Changing in metabolic processes, maybe you're increasing metabolism or decreasing metabolism or changing metabolism from one type to another. Or you could turn on and off genes. So we just got done with chapters 12 and 13, um, where you are learning about how gene information is expressed as proteins during trans translation. So maybe one of the responses of a signaling molecule binding to its target cell is to express a gene like hemoglobin or insulin or growth hormone. All right, so those are the four stages, and I'm going to have this slide at the beginning of every one of these stages just to remind us where we're at in this process. So we're going to now talk about sending signals, stage one. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so we have um, a couple different examples. So again, sending signals is just some signals being sent. So this first example we're going to have is called a neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters are signaling molecules, the little red triangles here. We have in this upper picture, the little green circles that we have here in this lower picture, these guys right here. So these are the signaling molecules. When these signaling molecules are released from a neuron, they are called neurotransmitters. And their job is to communicate to other neurons usually, but they can also communicate to glands and they could also communicate to muscles to send that signal to tell that receiving cell what to do. Um, so in this top picture here, we just see a very generic relationship between the signaling neuron, so it's gonna be electrically active, it releases its signaling molecule, and then the target neuron will receive that signaling molecule, and it's gonna cause changes in that target neuron to tell it what to do, right? So your signal is, it's like you're telling somebody what to do. So if we look down at this picture, it's a super duper close up of that relationship between the signaling molecule, or this would be the signaling neuron. All right, they're calling it the presynaptic cell. It's the one sending the signal. And this is the target neuron, which they're calling the postsynaptic cell. And the reason why they're using that pre and postsynaptic word is because in neurons, you have this physical space between the signaling cell and the receiving cell. They do not touch, the membranes do not touch. There actually is a physical space between the two cells where ions and fluid and stuff float around. So that's the, called the synaptic cleft, or sometimes it's just called the synapse. So when you're talking about the presynaptic cell, this is the cell that's gonna be releasing the neurotransmitter. The postsynaptic cell is gonna be the one receiving the signal. Okay. So let's take a look at a very at an actual example of uh, a neurotransmitter and what it does on the postsynaptic cell. So in this example, uh, at the very end of the neuron, you have these little vesicles, right? We learned about vesicles back in the cells chapter. They're little packages um, of stuff. In this case, the stuff that they're packaging is the neurotransmitter, the little green circles. And this is most likely going to be a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. You don't have to know this, but if you're curious, now you do. Um, I can't draw that Y very good. Uh, and the reason why I named this is because if any of you are going to be taking A&P, like if you're signed up for 231 uh, in, the, in the summer or the fall. Oh my gosh, there we go. That kind of looks like a Y. If you're going to be taking 231, you're going to be learning all about acetylcholine and how it functions in neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication as well as neuron-to-muscle communication. So it's a very common neurotransmitter, and this is what it does, and this is how it works. So let's say you have your signaling neuron, the presynaptic cell, at the synaptic terminal, the big blob kind of knob at the end um, of the little branch. It's jam-packed full of these vesicles. When it fires, when it releases its uh, neurotransmitter, that's step four here, it releases the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. It crosses that synaptic cleft very quickly. So even though they are physically separated, they're not separated by a, a huge space. And then what we have here on the um, postsynaptic membrane is a receptor. Now I'm kind of jumping ahead to step two, but at least we can kind of see what's going on. When this receptor is not bound to acetylcholine, this channel is closed. 
And this is the channel that's specific for ions, specifically for sodium ions. They show potassium, but it really is for sodium ions mostly. So when the signaling molecule is absent, the channel is closed. When acetylcholine binds, that's the green circle, when it binds to that receptor, it physically changes the shape of that ion and it opens. And now we are going to follow the concentration gradient and allow sodium to rush into the cell. When you have a whole lot of this positively charged ion flooding into a cell, it excites that postsynaptic cell and it becomes active. There you go. I just went through all of the examples of a cell signaling for you with just this one example, focusing just on the neurotransmitters of sending the signal. But we saw reception, we saw transduction, and we saw response. All right, so <clears throat> that's one example of signaling molecules, um, neurotransmitters. Next one are hormones. So hormones are very similar to neurotransmitters. However, they do their job in a different environment where neurotransmitters did their job in the tiny little space of the synaptic cleft, or hormones do their job all over the body. And these hormones are sent all over the body, not through a branching neuron, but through the bloodstream. So this is, sorry, I just heard the ice cream truck out. <laughs> that kind of caught me off guard. Um, all right, so hormones are secreted into the bloodstream, and then the hormone chemicals now is in the bloodstream, travels all over the body to find its target cell. Um, so this is responsible for more long-distance communication or wide dispersal of communication of this particular signal. So I've given you a couple of examples. So I'll start with up one in the upper right. So this is the signaling cell. In this case, the endocrine cell. It's releasing its hormone. Those are little green circles. The hormone goes directly into the bloodstream, okay? So once anything goes into the blood, it goes all over the body and then diffuses out into all of the cells. And then the target is the target. That's where the hormone's actually going to do its job. But the way that makes it the target is not just that it's any old cell, but it has a receptor that is specific to that hormone molecule and specific at the molecular level. So if your hormone, is shaped like this, and you have a receptor that's shaped like this, it's not going to recognize it. So that hormone floating around will ig be ignored by any cell that does not have a receptor that matches it. So if we are wanting to try to see the receptor, it would have to be something that matches it. So this would be the receptor on the target cell that would bind that signaling molecule. So for hormones, connect the word, um, or so endocrine or hormones is long distance communication through the bloodstream. Okay? So I have that example here. We have another one here that's again just showing the endocrine cell releasing the hormone into the bloodstream and the bloodstream is uh, eventually going to take that hormone to the target cell and the target responds only because it has that special receptor that is that recognizes that particular molecular shape. Uh, this picture, big picture over here is an actual example. So these other two pictures were kind of generic um, this diagrams of uh, endocrine communication or hormonal signals. This is an actual picture of one of your endocrine organs, and it's the most busiest, if you will, of our endocrine organs. It is your pituitary gland. This is your pituitary gland right here. It's a little dangly blob that sits off the base of your hypothalamus in your brain. The pituitary gland is responsible for secreting about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sometimes some researchers say, say nine um, hormones. Now that's a lot. Most endocrine organs release like one, maybe two hormones at a time. The pituitary gland can release up to nine, eight or nine hormones, depending on your resource. Um, so this one kind of tells you that these hormones, they go out and they control lots of different things in the body. So we have some hormones that affect ovaries and testes. These are your, um, what's called FSH and LH. You don't need to know these. These are just kind of a, a real life example. We have growth hormone. We have prolactin. We have adrenocorticotropic hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, oxytocin, and antidiuretic hormone. So we have a lot of hormones coming from the pituitary gland. And you, as you can see, does a wide variety of functions in all different parts of the body. And all of those hormones are all secreted into the same blood supply. 
right? This capillary bed right here, and it leaves and goes out into your general circulation. So we've got nine hormones dumping into your bloodstream. How do they know where to go? Well, they don't. They just go into the bloodstream. The bloodstream carries the hormones all over the place, and the cells that have the receptors will respond. So if you are secreting thyroid hormone, thyroid hormone will go to your liver, it'll go to your big toe, it'll go to your brain, it'll go to your stomach, but it also goes to the thyroid. And of all of those destinations where the TSH is going to be uh, delivered to, the thyroid is the only one that's going to have a receptor to recognize that thyroid stimulating hormone and do something, um, steps two, three, and four of that uh, signal that was sent from the pituitary gland. All right, so those are probably two of the most common ones that you're going to be seeing, especially if you move on to the ANP, is the neurotransmitters coming from neurons and the hormones coming from endocrine glands. But there are a couple more that we want to mention. So this next one, um, even though it's not as commonly seen again, um, it's very common in your body. So this is what we call paracrine signals, also sometimes referred to as local, local signals. So... Um, Neurotransmitters coming from neurons are like a quick uh, electrical impulse. Hormones coming from your endocrine organs are a little bit slower. They go into the bloodstream, but they can go long distance. They can go all over the body. Paracrine are local signals. The, the signaling molecules released, usually called a paracrine factor or a secretory factor or a local regulator or a paracrine factor, a prostaglandin, there's lots of different names, um, but it just is released into its little neighborhood. It doesn't go into the bloodstream to go far away. It doesn't go into a synapse. It just goes to like maybe th up to three cells away or whatever it happens to do. So again, I have a couple of examples. So here would be your secretory cell is the orange one in the middle. It's releasing its factor, its uh, signaling molecule, and the target cells are just these guys right close to it. And they're gonna, again, they're gonna have receptors that will recognize that paracrine factor um, and then do their response. So here, they have the word local. So signaling molecule, just releasing the signaling, or signaling cell, releasing the signaling molecule, just a little green circles, goes a short distance. So remember, paracrine is short, local. And again, the receptor that matches that signaling molecule, those are the cells that are going to be um, recognizing that and responding to that signal. So just like with some of the other slides, I have some diagrammatic views and then I have a real life example. So anybody dealing with allergies so far? I sat outside of my porch for like five minutes and sneezed um, for the rest of the day. So what I have in my body, I have these wonderfully purple cells here. This is called a mast cell, lives in my nasal mucosa and my connective tissues. And on it are these wonderful, right? You got to, you just got to have a positive attitude about stuff. I have these wonderfully red receptors in this picture. And they are, they have been designed, they have been made to recognize pollen, the wonderful grass pollen, these yellow blobs. Okay. So that is the signaling, uh, that's the incoming signal to the, his, to the mast cell is the pollen coming from the environment. But then what the mast cell does is it releases its own little signaling molecules. That's all of these little specks, the purple dots that are coming out of the mast cell. That is the local paracrine factor. And what it does in my nasal mucosa is when it releases these histamines and heparins and prostaglandins, all these fun names for these local signaling molecules, it causes irritation in my respiratory tract. It causes vasodilation. So my nose is runny, my eyes are watery. It causes itchiness of all of those mucosa. But those allergies are localized to like just my face, <laughs> like my eyeballs and my nose. And that's about it. I'm not going to have grass allergy responses in my stomach or in my kidneys or in my big toe because these histamines are locally uh, local signals. They're only going to go to the environment right in my respiratory mucosa. All right. Uh, and NO, this is nitrous oxide. This is also um, a pretty prominent paracrine signal. It, in muscles and like smooth muscles around your blood vessels, it helps to vasodilate um, if you need more blood flow to a particular area, but it's local. It's just close by. Um, all right, so we have one more. 
uh, example of sending signals. We have direct contact. So this would be where two cells physically touch each other and the signaling molecules are transmitted that way. So we have a couple different examples. So in this box here, what we see are two cells that are physically touching and they're, that's kind of part of their tissue. Like they're not moving to touch each other. They're just made that way. So it might be like two plant cells. Plant cells are just like bricks all hooked together or like two cells in a tissue, like in a muscle tissue or a skin tissue. They're just built that way. So sometimes they have these little pathways, pathways, um, pathways, passages through the cell wall um, or the plasma membrane and it allows substances to move through those. So in animals, these little passageways are called gap junctions. In plants, these little passageways are called plasmodesmata. So the reason why it's called direct cell contact is the cells are touching and the communication is happening between them because they're touching, okay? The bottom picture would be not so much that cells are communicating because they're actually physically attached due to being in a tissue, but maybe you have a cell roaming around and it's going to signal something, but to do that, it's going to have to touch. It can't, it's not releasing anything like we saw with neurotransmitters or paracrine or hormones. So in this case, our ligand, this is the signaling molecule. This is the signal. All right, so the ligand is just another name for a signaling molecule, and here's your target. Okay, so for these two, for the target cell to get the signal, they actually physically have to touch because the ligand is attached to the surface of the that's sending. So this is the sending cell. Okay. So what's our real life example? So up here in this black and white micrograph picture, this is what's called a natural got such a cool name natural killer cell natural killer cell that's awesome the t stands for target so that's the target cell so natural killer cells are part of your immune system so their job is to kind of roam around they're free free moving cells they can kind of amoeboid movement so they're they don't have to flow with the blood they can come out of the blood they can go into the blood but they roam around and they look for cells that are abnormal they look for cells that have um either like surface proteins that are wrong maybe like in a cancer cell or surface proteins that could be evident that the cell is infected okay so your target is going to be sending the signal that's I'm abnormal, I'm abnormal, I'm abnormal. The natural killer cell is going to come in and recognize that and it physically touches the target cell. And when it does that, it releases some killer chemicals and destroys that target cell. And that's a good thing for your body because that target cell could have been in a viral infected cell and we do we want to kill the virus where it's at. Or maybe that target cell was a cancerous cell. Um, and it was mutating and we want to destroy that cancer cell before it starts to grow too big into a tumor. So natural killer cells would have the receptor that would recognize that ligand, the signaling molecule on the surface of that abnormal cell. All right, so those are our four examples of how cells send signals. So we had neurotransmitters, we had endocrine with sending of hormones, we had paracrine, which is local, and we have direct cell contact. Okay, so those are our examples of sending signals. All right, I will see you for the next video of signal reception. We'll take a look at different kinds of receptors that cells have to pick up these signals. Okay, bye.